welcome in everybody. This is Vicious Talk with Benny P. You might not recognize both of our faces right here. I'm doing a takeover representing all things analysis. Benny P, Ben Perez is getting married today, guys. So he's a little bit busy, I would say. Uh, Bridget, his uh, new wife or going to be new wife, wouldn't let him come on to record the podcast. I'm just kidding. They're a great couple. We love Bridget. She's part of the ATA family now, going to be. And I am here with David Philstein, longtime friend and uh, longtime friend of uh, all things analysis and longtime friend of mine. David, welcome to the show. Yeah, hey, super happy to be here. And hey, congrats to Ben. Surprised he's not doing the podcast at the altar, but you know, <laughs> sometimes sometimes you got to prioritize. Yeah, the other day I tried to do an Instagram live, maybe uh, the dra- first day of the draft, and I was going to do an unbox of the uh, the Trevor Lawrence pack. We're going to do it today. Ben's running around like a madman. You know, he's planning a wedding is no easy task as someone who's gone through it myself. So you know, we, we wish him the best of luck, and he's going to have a great day. But David. I am so glad to have you on. I'm going to try to live up to Ben's shoes as the host and, you know, nail you with some of these awesome questions. But first, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Uh, so, hey, everybody. David Philstein. Um, as Connor said, longtime friends. We, we go way, way back, back to middle school, even earlier. Yeah, um, too far back. Yeah, look, I've been, I've been in the New England area a long time. Um, truly very big sports fan. I, I love the NFL. In, in many ways, I'm a, I'm a one-trick pony. Literally just NFL, uh, but diehard Patriots fan, been a Patriots fan for a very long time and um, have been waiting for this draft that we're going through right now for a long time. So can't wait to talk about that. Yeah, we're recording this. It's 930 uh, Eastern on Saturday morning. So the first three rounds of the draft are in uh, the next four rounds are coming this weekend. So we have a little bit uh, of a few picks to react to. So yeah, let, let's jump right into it right off the bat. Draft yeah. day reactions, David. And if you want, we can start with your Patriots. What do you think? Hey, I'm, I'm super excited. You know, B- Bill has a rep of kind of like not doing too great in drafts. Um, I don't know if I, I don't know if I fully agree with that rep. I think, I think Bill is a pretty decent drafter. Not amazing, <laughs> but definitely not bad. Um, a lot of misses, yeah. but some hits, you know, when you get Brady in the it, sixth round, you, you can't blame him, you know? True. But then again, that's 20 years ago, you know? It is. But it's I been so long time. This way. I, I came into this draft thinking that one of two things is going to happen. I thought that we were either going to mortgage our future and draw and uh, trade into the, you know, top 10 to draft a quarterback or alternatively trade down and get a bunch of second round, third round picks and end up drafting just a bunch of defensive backs, which it seems like all that Belichick does is draft defensive backs in the second and third round. And don't get me wrong, some of them pan out. When Mac Jones fell to us and we didn't even need to trade anything to get him, I could not believe it. And the truth is, I would have been happy with any of the top five, you know? And the fact that Mac Jones fell to us, we didn't have to trade more for it, and all the pundits always saying, hey, Mac Jones is a perfect fit in New England. I mean... If, if you're unhappy with that as a Pats fan, I'd love to hear why you're unhappy with that. This is, this is such a clean result. Um, and then so that's the first round. Um, do you want to talk about the, how the Giants did in the first round, or I can talk more let's, about Let's the, talk a little bit about Mac Jones right now. So yeah. we're talking about these top five quarterbacks. Mac Jones, the last of them to go, but, you know, it was the big mm-hmm. five. So really nice for the Patriots not to have to move out of that position. It's funny, though, because I was, t- I was listening to uh, some Boston sports radio yesterday. And their take was they weren't happy that the Pats stayed where they were and they were able to get Mac Jones. It made them feel uncomfortable because it, because they didn't trade up for Mac Jones or Justin Fields. They were saying that, well, how much could the Pats really love Mac Jones if they weren't even willing to trade up two spots, I would have preferred them to trade up, lose some of their pick value and then draft Mac Jones. What is this twisted logic? (laughs) Hey, hey I, I, it's actually really funny that, that they say this. I don't fully agree with them, but I hear where they're coming from. If Belichick mortgaged his future on Mac Jones, that would be like saying, I want this guy. I'm taking this guy, right? Here, it's like, well, I guess we'll take him. Like, it's lucky that mm-hmm. it's played out this way, but it's a purely psychological game. 
right? Like at the end of the day, who cares? You walked away with Mac Jones. And if that's your guy, then you might've played like a truly Belichickian like strategy to get him. Um, hey, no, I, I get it. You know, at the end of the day, you, you want to see desire for that player from an organization. Like how good must a player feel like the Patriots second round pick Christian Barmore when we traded up to get him? Right. I mean, we're like, damn, like this guy's our guy. And the past um, don't trade up. That's not their thing. They love value margins, you know, marginal value trade down for a few extra picks. Yeah. hundred percent. So no, it, 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 I, I look at it this way. First round picks, they hit, you know, it's interesting and we can talk about it. What percentage of a time is a first round pick an actually serviceable starter? And I, and I'd venture that it's somewhere in the realm of, you know, 60, 70% of the time, right? About a Maybe coin even flip higher. for quarterbacks. Yeah. For quarterbacks, especially. But if you told me, hey, David, we're going to risk your first round pick and there's a good chance that he's going to be a franchise quarterback or he's going to, you know, flame out and, and suck. But by the way, the only thing you're risking on it is one first round pick. Right. I'd say I'd do it any day of the week, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And what we're hearing is that Mac Jones is probably the most NFL ready quarterback out of the group, aside from probably Trevor Lawrence, who we all knew was locked and loaded as the number one pick. Um, but you have guys like Trey Lance going to the San Francisco 49ers. He really only threw a couple hundred passes in college. And now he's going into a system where Jimmy Garoppolo is 24 and eight as a starter there. What's that situation going to look like? I don't know. I think the Pats might've lucked out getting Mac Jones at 15 overall, when you consider what some of these other teams had to do. Now, if we want to move on to my team, I, they kind of pulled what the Pats normally do. And we were sitting there in the 11th spot. Boom, here come the Eagles. They jump one spot ahead of us and they take Devonta Smith. All right, now what do we do? Because mm -hmm. there's a couple good quarterbacks left on the board, but I think the Giants are still committed to giving Danny Jones one more year, right? And obviously mm -hmm. when you have Justin Fields and Mac Jones on the board and you decide to trade back, that's clearly the message that they were giving. I, I personally loved that we got so much value out of it. I do not necessarily like trading back because I want to get the big name. I want to get the sexy name, the Mac Jones, Justin Fields, Devonta Smith. But I'm pretty happy with number 20 getting Tony. Sounds like he's a really athletic receiver, six foot tall, four, three, seven. Uh, I think he'll help the Giants, but I don't know. What, what, what's your take on what the Giants did? So first and foremost, so happy the Giants didn't draft the quarterback. Um, I think that even if it's a question of believing in Danny Jones or not believing in Danny Jones, I think that drafting Mac Jones or Justin Fields, there is a recipe for disaster. You're going to be coming in with a distraction. You're going to be coming in with Jones on, you know, on the back of his feet and the new rookie coming back and kind of like, you know, off balance. So look, at the end of the day, if you guys are bad next year, draft a quarterback this year, you know, I think you got to give him one more shot or, or, or more shots. I'm not saying it's one year or bust. In terms of what you guys pulled off for the skill position and the trade back, I love it. I love it. Like you guys come with a first round pick extra one next year mm -hmm. and a great skill player. Of course, would getting Devonta Smith be nice? Oh yeah, it'd be amazing. That would be sick. But Tony was always pegged to be a first round talent. So you come away with a first round talent and maybe take away some of those question marks around Devonta Smith and his weight, which I personally don't buy into and a first round pick next year if i'm a giants fan i'm not ecstatic because you're right you don't get that big sexy name but i'm really really happy i think it's shrewd drafting by gettleman yeah i think both of us can walk away happy from how the first round or the first couple of rounds went for for our respective teams you know you get your quarterback i get to add some more weapons around my potentially blossoming young quarterback my worry now is we have these five quarterbacks are they going to get the protection they need? But before we jump into that, let's just talk about the five quarterbacks that were drafted in the first 15 picks. Because like you said, it's kind of a coin flip, especially with these quarterbacks. Which of these five do you think is going to have the most immediate impact on their teams? And then additionally, which of them do you think will have the best career? And inversely, which of these guys is going to flame out quickly? And for the listeners, we're talking about uh, first pick Trevor Lawrence, number two, Zach Wilson, Number three, Trey Lance. Justin Fields went 11th to Chicago. And then Mac Jones went 15th to the Pats. 
Well, let's first start and think about which of them are going to start day one. Um, and I think Trevor Lawrence, that's a lock. Like he'll be starting day one. Zach Wilson, also, I think that's a lock. I think he'll be starting day one. Um, Trey Lance, I actually don't know that he's going to start day one. I wouldn't be surprised if they either redshirt him for the entire year. As you said, he's only thrown a couple hundred passes in college. Getting him a year behind JG would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, Fields, do you think Fields is going to be starting? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Andy Dalton was the projected starter, and we saw what he did with the Cowboys last year. He's he's not going anywhere. I, I, I'm <laughs> placing my confidence in Justin Fields, and I'm also proclaiming that Allen Robinson is now playing with the best quarterback he's ever played with, and he hasn't even thrown a pass in the NFL yet. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be really exciting to see them because, hey, the Chicago Bears, they were a quarterback away for a long time. I'm, like, this is, hey, they made the playoffs last year. Yeah. Right? That defense yeah, they did. They made the playoffs last year. Yeah, this is, this, is, this is a very interesting team all of a sudden. Maybe not this year, but definitely next year. Yeah. I don't think that Mac Jones is going to be starting day one. Okay. I think, so you think, I think that we're going to be putting – I think so, yeah. Um, so to get back to the questions that you had asked in the beginning, Connor, who do, who do you think that we're going to have the most immediate impact? Well, right, let's talk about the rookie first? of the year. Yeah, who, who do you think is going to win the rookie of the year? It's usually a quarterback, so I think it's safe to pick out of these five. Uh, it's got to be Trevor Lawrence, right? Like, the guy's a stud, and I think that, you know, Urban Meyer's coming in. He's going to come in, coming in with some new concepts. Trevor Lawrence, obviously great skill. Um, at the end of the day, actually, it'd be interesting to see how often the first overall drafted quarterback wins rookie of the year, but I got to imagine it's like, you know, 30% plus. I think Herbert was the second quarterback off the board. Burrow was number one, but he went down to injury. He certainly looked primed to win rookie of the year if he stayed healthy too. So it's, it's not a bad yeah. pick. And when you consider Trevor Lawrence's situation, the Jags have really good weapons. LaVisca yeah. Chanel was a really nice rookie last year. DJ Chark he was a first round pick to explode. So you pair those two really skilled wide receivers and the running back situation is really good too. James Robinson was outstanding last year. They go ahead and they add Travis Etienne as a pass catching running back. I don't necessarily like the pick, but I think he'll help Trevor yeah. Lawrence. It's really weird because <laughs> uh -huh. the, the running back room was pretty solid with Robinson. And I think they had Hyde as a backup. So a decent one-two punch. Neither of those guys are really burners though. So I can understand why you want to get an Etienne. Let's and, see. And you have something you want to say. That, yeah. I mean, and we're, we're talking about a secret weapon that was working out with the Jaguars oh. this last week. Did you see that? I mean, that's what, what are we? If you got, if you got Tim Tebow catching passes at the tight end position, you bet oh, you're going to be yeah. rookie of the year. <laughs> and the thing is, I think he would probably be <laughs> at least one of their top three tight ends. I mean, you look at their tight ends, they're kind of no name players. I think it was like James O'Shaughnessy and a couple other guys around that level. So Tebow what, would have a Eifert chance to get there? on the field. Eifert was there for a short period of time. He's bouncing all over the place. I, I can't keep track of him, but I don't know if he's there anymore. But a guy who's mm -hmm. always dealt with injuries can't stay on the field. So, I mean, Certainly, if, if Tebow still has a little bit left, we know he's an incredible athlete and he's an absolute beast of a human being. He could certainly make waves if you if you throw Trevor Lawrence on, on the team with him. It'd be a lot of fun. I mean, that I mean, big headlines no matter what, right? Like, that would be, just be exciting no matter what happens. Yeah. There. So, so I think you get a big boost in value to those wide receivers as well if we're talking about fantasy impact. <clears throat> Guys like DJ Chark and LaVisca Chenault should see a lot better passes than they were receiving from... Gardner Minshew, the mustache, Mr. Jorts himself. So this team, I think, is mm -hmm. going to improve a lot immediately. Um, the other situation, so Justin Fields comes in, replaces Mitch Trubisky, that team, and, and Nick Foles, who, who started a little bit last year, that team, all their wide receivers are going to get a boost. That's, you know, Anthony Miller, and that's Allen Robinson. So you really like to see that. I'm not sure if I'm going to give any of the Pats wide receivers a boost, similarly with the 49ers or the Jets. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. I mean, I'd say that if I had to choose one team with an improvement to their uh, to their receiving core from the 49ers, Jets, and Patriots, I'd probably say the Jets are most likely to be impacted. But that's just because I think Zach Wilson starting day one versus Trey Lance will be probably behind Garoppolo. And I do still think that it's going to be Cam Newton. 
Yeah, I mean, part of my take on the Jets and Sam Darnold is that I actually still think Sam Darnold is a talented player, and the Jets never have really done anything to set up their recent quarterbacks for success when you consider the talents around them. Uh, so who was catching passes last year? They they got rid of Roby Anderson. He went to the Panthers and looked amazing with Teddy Bridgewater, really who's, good. who's about an average quarterback, I would say. And he looked subpar on, on the Jets. So I think the wide receivers, just by being on the Jets, are immediately downgraded. Maybe Crowder's okay next year. I, I still like him because it's mm-hmm. the short passes. Those are the easy ones to complete for a new quarterback. Um, so there's but, two, two wide receivers come to mind. I remember there was one. I had Crowder on my fantasy team, and I was always super frustrated because another – his name escapes me, though. There's another wide receiver that was doing quite Rashad well. Rashad Perriman. Perriman did pretty well. And then I think – was it a rookie that was playing well for them last year? Denzel Mims. I'll look it up in a sec. Yes. Mims was doing okay, and they just drafted Elijah Moore, who's considered mm-hmm. like a really, really good slot receiver. And they took him with the second pick in the second round. But that's actually like a pretty significant value spent on him too. So yes. I agree though. I mean, Jets are just not – Jets quarterbacks are not set up with success in terms of their weapons. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, if you're going to take a flyer on one of these rookies, I'm probably going to go with Trevor Lawrence or maybe Mac Jones later on. Probably not. I don't know. I think I'm probably just going to stick with Trevor Lawrence. I don't, I don't think you want any of these guys as your starting quarterback in your fantasy roster though, to be honest. Uh, no, Justin I Fields Definitely. could be interesting if he can get enough rushing yards. If he can start to do something like Jalen Hurts did last year, I could see him having a large impact. Similarly with Trey Lance, but again, we don't know if these guys are going to come in and start right away. So, um, next topic I want to talk about is some of uh-huh. these drafts. You're making a decision: do you want the sexy pick or do you want to protect a quarterback? And this, I think, is a really, really interesting topic because we have teams like the Bengals, right? They, they just invested a shit ton of money in Joe Burrow with their first overall pick last year. And he goes ahead and he, he rips his leg apart because they can't protect him. Now, this is a team with Tyler Boyd, T. Higgins, A.J. Green, Joe Mixon, talent, endless talents around them. And they go ahead and they add another wide receiver instead of putting someone on that offensive line to protect their investment. We saw what happens in the Super Bowl with Patrick Mahomes when you don't protect your investment. You're not going to win games. What are these teams doing? The Eagles, they go and get Devonta Smith. We saw how bad that O-line was last year. Carson Wentz was getting killed. He could barely complete a pass. And part of that was because he had the yips because everybody was in the backfield all the time. You had the Giants. Danny Jones had more fumbles than anyone in the league last year. I mean, and then you go to the Steelers. They were last in the league in rushing because of how poor their O-line is. What's going to, is adding Najee Harris a running back really going to fix their running problems? I think a lot of these teams, the issues start with the O-line. So what is your take on getting the sexy talent, the, you know, the, the Jamar Chase, the Devonta Smith, or would you rather shore up your O-line? What's the analysis? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. And I, my thoughts have developed on this because my first gut take was make the shrewd long-term move take the tackle, take the O-lineman, protect your quarterback. I was going to say some catchy line, something like, yeah, okay, the wide receiver will fill your stadium, but the O-line will win you the Super Bowl. But I thought about it a little bit more, and I want to talk specifically about the Bengals situation, where they draft Jamar Chase. um, When Snell, the best uh, offensive tackle, was available on the board there. And I'm thinking – or. I'm or so well, sorry, Panay so well. And I'm thinking to myself, like, geez, like they got to take that 10 times out of 10. But I thought about it some more. And my perspective is this Jamar Chase, consensus number one wide receiver in the draft. Mm-hmm. And everybody knows, you know, it was Burroughs' top weapon in, um, in college. Yep. So my perspective was actually this. And I think this is the position that I'll try and defend that as good as bolstering your offensive line is you're never really going to have an opportunity like this to get the top rated wide receiver who has good chemistry with your quarterback available in the right place. You're not going to have an opportunity like this. So you, you maybe you don't necessarily desperately need a wide receiver, but you are taking your offense into a very cool place with this move. And Hey, I saw a Reddit comment that something said something along the lines of, it's such a shame we don't have any other draft picks to address our offensive line this year. It's like, yeah, I mean, 
Now they need to start drafting offensive linemen. And actually, I'm not 100% certain who they drafted in the second and third round. What do you think, Connor? My, my personal opinion is you need to protect your investment. You need to hedge against you know, somebody coming in the backfield and just absolutely taking your team down because your court, you lose your quarterback, you lose everything. You can lose a wide receiver and you can certainly come back from that. But how many teams, aside from maybe the Nick Foles Eagles, have had a, a backup quarterback lead them to a Super Bowl? It, it just doesn't happen. And so I'm much more, and especially the injuries that these quarterbacks get when you're talking about, um, when you're talking about somebody who tears their ACL, this could be possibly like a career ending injury or at least career altering. And I mean, what are the smartest teams do? What, when I look at the smartest organizations, I do think of, you know, the Patriots and, and the chiefs, these are teams that are very shrewd and they know what to do when they want to protect certain players. Well, the chiefs saw what the recipe is to win. And it's clearly not just talent. You need to protect your quarterback. And what did they do this off season? They directly address that with big signings and big trades. And that I think right. is the it's smart decision. Impressive. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I and, previously and said on the podcast with Ben, if the Bengals take Sewell, I'm going to go out and I'm going to try and buy some Joe Burrow shares. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to buy his rookie card. I'm going to buy some memorabilia. I'm going to put him on my fantasy roster, my dynasty roster, because I have a lot more confidence in his career longevity now and his ability to succeed. They went out and got a wide receiver. I'm not doing that now because I think he's in a very similar position as last year. <clears throat> And we saw what the yeah. recipe was last year. We saw, we saw what happens. We, we know the outcome. If, if, if I'm the Bengals GM, I look at this and I'm, and I'm, and I'm pained because I see advantages in both routes. I, I think that I still take the tackle. I think I take the tackle. I take so well. But, you know, I'm looking at it. The Bengals with their second round pick, they took Jackson Carmen from Clemson. He's considered the fourth ranked offensive uh, uh offensive tackle in the draft let's see who they took in the third round they, uh, they took a defensive end in the third round but you know let me ask you this question what if they took a tackle in the first round and then a wide receiver in the second round how would you feel about that if you're going to address the position in the first three rounds i think you're still okay if you're saying jamar chase is just by far and away the best target and we think that there's value to be had in the second round, we can still get a top five tackle. Sure, go ahead. But now I'm, I'm thinking again about my Giants because we have an all-world talent in Saquon Barkley, possibly the best running back of all time when you consider just his vision and his physical traits. But he's been completely hampered by the Giants O-line since he came in as a rookie. And what did we do this year in the draft? We got a wide receiver. Okay, great. We're going to help Danny Jones. But in the second and third rounds, can we please address this O-line not only for Daniel Jones, but for Saquon, you know, you, you need to have holes to run through. If you can't get out of the backfield, if you have guys hitting you in the backfield, you're not going to turn it in, in, into anything positive. And the Giants, what did they do in the second and third rounds? They went ahead and they got a cornerback and a D end. And we're uh, yeah. in the Giants defense was great last year. They were, they were borderline top 10. They were shutting teams down. They were a difficult team to play. But we all know that their issue was scoring points. So I'm I'm really displeased with how they've handled certain aspects of this draft. I'm glad we got the value in the trade, but I don't think we've addressed all the needs we have. And it it the O line's been a problem for the Giants for years and years. Yeah, I don't know. I, I completely agree with you, Connor. Like I was looking at it and I was like, I was going through the two the second and the third round, and I was like, Well, where's the tackle? Where's right. the offensive help? And it's like, oh, the end, cornerback, like, that's too bad. Hey, I mean, at the end of the day, they, they probably are confident in their line's development, right? But then again, you look at what the Chiefs did. You know, you, you mentioned them a little bit earlier. You take Thune, the best guard arguably in the NFL right now. You trade for Orlando Brown. It's like, okay, those are big boy moves. Huge and moves, huge. If your Giants traded your first round pick for uh, Orlando Brown, how would you feel? I would have felt Instead ecstatic because I look at my wide receiver room on the Giants and I see Kenny Galladay, outstanding, mm -hmm. easily a number one wide receiver, two years ago led the league in touchdowns, very underrated, was stuck on a bad Lions team. Number two, Sterling Shepard really has developed into an awesome slot receiver with the ability to play outside on occasion. 
Darius Slayton, incredible deep threat, really long and lanky, can go up and win jump balls. There's my starting three wide receivers. Plus you add an Evan Ingram, who's essentially a hybrid Aaron Hernandez style tight end. I don't think we need more offensive weapons. I wanted to shore up that offensive line. So I would have been ecstatic if we went ahead and traded our first round pick where we took, uh, took the wide receiver out of Florida, Tony, and we went ahead and got Orlando Brown. Well, one thing that they're still, we can't close the door on. Hey, trades are allowed for a long time. So, you know, who knows? We might take a look at this and, and maybe the Giants look at their wide receiver room and say, you know, we've got some studs. Maybe there's a trade coming up where they try and shore up some offensive talent, like literally with a tackle. Granted, it's still draft picks that are usually the best capital to get a trade like that through the door. And time and time again, what we see with some of these best teams who have a quarterback that they absolutely love, they're going to consult the quarterback and they're going to get his opinion. Okay, Patrick, do you want a running back? Do you want a wide receiver? Do you want an O-lineman? Last year, he said, I want a pass catching running back. They got Clyde Edwards Hilaire. This year, okay, you see what, what Miami did. They went and got Jalen Waddle. Well, Tua played with him in college. Do you think they talked to Tua about that pick? Of course. Same thing with, with Burrow in, in getting Jamar Chase, right? They're setting these guys up for success with players that they're comfortable with. On the other side of the ball, we have a situation with Aaron Rodgers where he wants to leave the team because year after year, these guys never take somebody on the offense. They never get this guy help. And Aaron Rodgers was responsible for the top scoring offense last year. He was an MVP, and yet they drafted his replacement in the first round. It's incredible. What do you think of the Rodgers drama? I mean, for me, one of the things that I like, I'm consistently shocked at how often stories like this leak. I'm always like, you guys got to keep this stuff in house. It's just such yep. horrible drama. But hey, I, I get it. You know, if I'm Aaron Rodgers, I look at what the Packers are capable of and clearly proved to be capable of MVP season, NFC championship. And, you know, hindsight's 2020. But you look back on it and you say, if they had an extra cornerback, if they had an extra wide receiver, if they had an extra anything, another starter on the field, would that have been enough to propel them towards the Super Bowl? Conversely, it's Devontae Adams and nobody else catching balls. But conversely, imagine a situation with Aaron Rodgers where, you know, the guy gets injured. You know, what was the year? I think it was 2017 or 18 that he missed pretty much the entire season due to injury. Or, or a big portion of it, if that had happened, everybody would have been applauding Packers like Jordan management Love for having the wherewithal to draft Jordan Love, who could have stepped in. Imagine if Jordan Love played well and brought them deep into the playoff. Everybody would be like, you know, it'd be a totally different storyline. That being said, that's not the, necessarily the right mentality to have. You don't draft backups in the first round. You draft starters. And what the Packers did does not make sense to me. If I'm Rodgers, I'm unhappy. And I, I, I mean, let's talk about it. You want to talk about whether you think he's going to be coming back? What do you think is going to happen as a result of all this? I think it's a great question. And <clears throat> we have statements from, from the, the Packers camp saying, we're not trading Rodgers. He's our MVP. He's our quarterback. And yet you have Rodgers saying, I'm not going to play for this team next year. Uh, so something has to come to pass, right? Are they going to, which side folds? Rodgers is even talking about possibly sitting out a year and just retiring. And then he would be able to come back kind of like Brett Favre did, right? He retired and then went ahead to the, the Jets and then eventually the Vikings. Um, and speaking of Brett Favre, the Packers have done this before, right? They drafted Aaron Rodgers four years before he was going to become a starter and they pushed out an all-time great. They're, gonna, they're doing the same thing here. The, the difference is it's not 20 years ago. It's 2021, and this I is know, not how star quarterbacks are treated in this day and age. And yet they continually decide to just brush off Aaron Rodgers' opinion and his needs, and no other team is really doing this. It's incredible. Fun stat for you. You know how many years Aaron Rodgers was starting for the Packers? 16 years. You know how many years Brett Favre was starting for the Packers? Tell me it's 16 years. How many years Bart Starr was starting for the Packers? Stop. Stop. 16 again? I, I, don't, that, that, I think it's 16, but I could be wrong. I don't want to mislead our viewers. 
But um, I saw some stat along those lines. But it, there is a remarkable parity. Not well, parity isn't the right word. But there's a weirdly consistent in the amount of time these franchise quarterbacks at the Packers start for their team. I think Aaron Rodgers comes back. My, my guess, he comes back. They figure it out. They gloss things over. I mean, they took a wide receiver in the second or third round, also with the last name Rodgers. Um, I don't remember what his first name is. But, you know, slowly but surely starting to address it a little bit. Um, also, if I'm Rodgers, a little bit of a – and it's not him that broke this story. It's, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's like someone else that leaked it. But it's a little bit of a diva move. You know, like, you got to understand, like, the team needs to plan for the future. He's a 37-year-old quarterback. Drafting a quarterback in the first round, hey, planning for the future or cashing in all in now, that's a, that's a move that the organization needs to make collectively. And if they go one way versus the other, it's a philosophical problem rather than, um, you know, a problem of like what's correct and what's not correct. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. I mean, in, in terms of what Green Bay has done to support Aaron Rodgers, let's just talk about their draft history. And David, I'm going to hit you with a, a little bit of trivia. What was the last okay. offensive player drafted by the Packers? And it's an easy one. It's Jordan Love last well, year. Well, Jordan Love. Oh, sorry. I thought you meant other so, than Jordan Love. My bad. So going back, what's the last one outside of Jordan Love? <laughs> I have no Eddie Lacy. <laughs> I, 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 I should say I should say in the good. I should say in the first round, Eddie Lacy was a second rounder. Oh, okay. I think he was high. He was high. I, I don't know. I don't I don't remember who it is. So it's actually an offensive lineman in 2011 Derek Sherrod was the last time they took an offensive player in the first round that's 10 years ago you want to you want to know the last time they took an offensive player that's a that was at a skill position not named Jordan Love take it take a gander uh, I mean I, I'm guessing it's a really long time ago also apologies to, to our viewers about my frozen video right now glitching out a little bit and now you got a nice little vantage point of me it's just, it's frozen um, but I don't know. I'm, I mean, look, I'm going to guess that it's quite a while ago. Um, when was it, Connor? It was Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, there you go. Wow. In, Have they in ever 2005. In, in 2002, they drafted Javon Walker. In 2005, that was the last time they took an a, a offensive skill position player, and it was Aaron Rodgers. Damn, that's crazy. So his whole career, the only offensive skill position player they took in the first round was his backup. If I'm Aaron Rodgers, I'm hey. saying, screw you too. I want out of here. That's bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Hey, the guy's doing well in jeopardy. Um, so, hey, Connor, I want to apologize. I'm having a little bit of technical problems right now. Uh, my, my, right. my, my. What we're going to do, David, is I'm going to do a quick pause, and then let's try okay. to have you rejoin, okay? Okay, and cool. for yeah, the viewers know, my, out my there, first. you're going to hear a little quick commercial break. Welcome in, everybody. Connor Larson here. We're going to do a box break of the Trevor Lawrence tops. We tried to do it the other day, but uh, Ben is getting married, so he was a little bit busy. He couldn't join. So instead, I'm going to do it in the middle of this podcast I just recorded with David about the NFL draft. It's still happening this weekend, so it's a perfect time to go ahead and unbox the limited edition tops Trevor Lawrence Act right here one in five have an autograph card so we're really hoping we hit the auto here this pack was retail $70 75 dollars uh, 90 with tax and shipping but you can go ahead and get it on ebay now from a reseller for around 200 300 so if you're considering buying one of these i want you guys to know what what you're getting so we're going to go ahead and we're going to unbox this first and see if we can't get a, a couple cool hits and obviously, we want to give you guys a preview if you're considering making the purchase yourself and see if it's uh, worth your time and money. All right, here we go. Never get these open. Now, the box apparently is limited edition too. There's one that's blue, one that's pink. So I have obviously the pink version. You can see here, so I got plastic wrap off. Open this up. Take a look at the box. All right. 
So this is how it looks when you unbox it. A little bit of styrofoam to protect. Tops has this sealed, so you can make sure that you know you're getting a sealed pack, uh, authentic from Tops. You want to make sure this is on there if you're going to buy it from a reseller. I'll tell you one thing about cards is you kind of have to have a couple fingernails or a pair of scissors handy if you want to get these boxes open. Okay. So first card on the deck right on top there, a little bit of skateboard T, skateboard Trevor. Pretty cool looking card, really fun preview. I'm really excited to unbox this pack with everyone. And I mean, I guess these are all considered rookie cards. He hasn't played a snap yet, but it's a limited edition pack. So nothing shocking here. They're all going to be Trevor Lawrence. So again, here's that first card. Now that I got the top off. It's called Dogtown, featuring artwork from Brooke and Chase Lawrence. So I believe these are his brother and sister who have done a lot of the designs on these cards. So you can see this one's a special design card. Looks really cool. Yeah, let me go ahead and a full pack in my hands. Be super careful. So this card on the bottom is sticking to the pack. So I'll wait on that one. Let's look at the rest of these. Okay, so standard tops Trevor Lawrence looks like a kind of a throwback 1952. Yeah, 1970 tops football. This one's really cool, really trippy. Very much a Kid Cudi vibe, man on the moon in space. Love the artwork here. I mean, I'm definitely gonna sleeve all of these and, and keep them for a long time. We're gonna put them up for sale on the website, atashop.com as well, if you guys wanna make an offer on any of these, but you know, I'm certainly happy to hold on to them and hope for a Tom Brady-like career out of Trevor Lawrence, and maybe these cards will shoot through the roof in terms of an investment. Here's the next card, it's black and white Trevor Lawrence. Pretty standard, ooh, that's interesting. Being some varsity. This one has what looks like damage to it, but I think that's part of the design as it's under the reflective seal. I'm not sure if this is big and bold. Yeah, I, I really don't know if this is a damage card they gave me or if it's actually part of the design. I'll have to do a little bit more research on that one, but that's certainly unique. You don't love to see a damage. Might have to call pops up on that one. All right, here's Trevor Lawrence in a hoodie. Looking goody. Featured tops design. So here's the 1959 design. These are really cool cards. I mean, gosh, Trevor Lawrence has some flow, doesn't he? 1967 designed. Here's a little action shot, Trevor with the football. 1972. Yeah, so all of these are cool. Nothing numbered so far. Obviously, no SIGs. We'll see that right on the card. 1958 design. You guys are going to see me lose my shit if there is a, if there is a SIG card in here. Trevor looking good. Good looking guy, right? Come on, I want I want some hair like that. Suit on, ready for draft day. Obviously already went number one overall. 1992, so a little bit of a later edition looking tops. 1978 tops Trevor Lawrence. This design's okay. I mean, a lot of the older designs, they're not that flashy. Ooh, that next one's really cool. 1995, I love this. I love the ones that the, the brother and sister designed. These are really just beautiful cards. Yeah, featuring artwork by Brooke and Chase Lawrence, Lava Lamp, number one. These are really cool. Go, there's another Trevor. They're all gonna be Trevor, obviously. <laughs> 1983 design, so. What Tops is doing is they're just showing all these retro designs as if 
Trevor Lawrence had come out in those years. Ooh, this one's a little bit spooky, looking like a ghost there. Avalanche number two. Another one, artwork, Brooke and Chase Lawrence. Ooh, Trevor looking mysterious there. That's fun. Okay. Bing. Metropolitan number two, another another one that's artwork. So I think the artwork ones are probably going to have a little bit more value if I had to guess. But again, these cards are hard to price because it's 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 a limited edition release. And so right now, since it's a recent release too, not a lot of these cards are on the market. Tops number two, 1956 design. It's cool. I actually like this one a lot for a retro design. I like the cutout shape around the white outline and then the blue background really makes it pop. Ooh, this is cool. It's a really cool design too. I think we might have a repeat there too. 1985 design. Did we get that one already? Ah, no, okay, so it's an alternate variation. You'll see these two. Very similar in style. Varsity number one and varsity number two. I don't know if one's more rare than the other or if they're both just base sets. Okay, so I've seen a lot of this one out on the market. 1986 tops design. Decent looking card. Definitely looks retro. These all do. Okay, artwork. Metropolitan number one. Another artwork card. Love the artwork cards. Retros are fun, but really all about the artwork. 1962 number seven. I, I don't know if you guys saw. I think I might have let a little sneak peek there. We do have a numbered card out of 99 which is really exciting. That's the type of limited edition card stock we bought this uh, pot pack for. So maybe it has a SIG, maybe it doesn't, but okay. So the last one before we get to that numbered card, see if we can't hide the numbered card from everyone. Tops, Trevor Lawrence. And then here we go. The 1955 Tops All-American Football. No SIG, but we have an out of 99 Trevor Lawrence. So when we're talking about a low stock, low edition card, this is a great one to have. You know, overall, I'm satisfied with the pack. I'm really disappointed I didn't get a signature card, but, you know, one in five, so 20% chance there. Uh, I'm going to list all these cards on the website, though. So probably most of them will be uh, pretty reasonable. Uh, give us a, a shout and give us a, a DM if you want to make an offer, if you're, if you're not happy with the price we have on the site. We'll definitely give it a consideration. And thank you guys for tuning in for this Trevor Lawrence box break. Oh, I forgot one more thing. We did have that one that's stuck in the bottom of the, of the pack there. Another good looking Trevor Lawrence card, the flower power edition. Flower power number two. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. All right, guys, we're back. We had a little bit of technical difficulties. Zoom crapped out on us. Uh, one of the things that comes up a lot with the pandemic is we're relying a lot more on technology nowadays and sometimes it fails uh but we're gonna manage and we're gonna get david back on the line right now and we're gonna talk about our uh, favorite long shot super bowl odds since we have a lot up in the air a lot of teams moving around this is where you can kind of get some value um last year this is when i placed a little bet on the tampa bay buccaneers right before they got tom brady and so i was able to get like a i don't know what was it like a 100 to 1 odds or something, something incredible. And I turned $10 into, I think, around 500. So maybe it was 50 to 1. But, it, you know, it was really, really exciting. And we're going to try and call out some of our favorite long shot odds right now. So, David, are there any teams that you have seen where you particularly think that you're getting some good value if you're talking about a Super Bowl bet right now? Yeah. Um, and actually, one of those teams is uh, the 49ers. You know, I, uh, I, I think that that's a team that is very well-rounded and it's been haunted by injuries. Um, they're an incredibly competitive division, but they're a team that have got a really solid core. I think Garoppolo comes in with a little bit of a fire at his back and I could see them, you know, coming in and, and, and really, really being a potential uh, winner. I, do I think they'll win? No, 
but it's something that you might be able to get good odds on. Yeah, so right now the San Francisco 49ers are sitting at plus 1,400. So it's 14 to 1 odds. So for every dollar you put down, you get $14 back if they happen to cash in and win the Super Bowl. So certainly some plus value there. And when you consider this was a team that was one missed pass away from winning a Super Bowl when uh, Jimmy Garoppolo just overthrew Emmanuel Sanders in the Super Emmanuel Bowl. Emmanuel Sanders. Game. And so last year, this team was without George Kittle for a large part of the season. Raheem Mostert was injured. Obviously, Jimmy G was injured and Debo Samuel. And so you're talking about their top four offensive weapons. Of course, this team had a bad year. But when teams go through injuries and they're able to bolster the rosters with some decent draft picks, oftentimes they they get even stronger the following year. So I really like that pick. Mm -hmm. What about you, Connor? What do you think? For me, there were a few teams that I'm targeting. And number one is the Rams. Um, The -hmm. Rams are plus 1,200. Again, we're going back to a team that just missed the Super Bowl. And they just added Matthew Stafford, who I think is is a really, really good quarterback. He's been very productive on the Lions, despite the fact that the Lions have been a really bad team for a long time. Uh, And now he's going to be with Sean McVay. He's going to have much better weapons. He's going to have much better protection and a much better defense so we won't be playing from behind. I think this Rams team reinvigorated with some new talent at the quarterback position and obviously just one of the most amazing defenses that exists when you consider Jalen Ramsey and Aaron Donald. Give me the Rams as a long shot. Uh, there are a couple other teams. Fully agree. Team. Hell yeah. Hell I mean, yeah. let me quickly respond to that. I fully agree. I mean, I, 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 I had a feeling you were going to say the Rams and I wanted to come in with something different, but I think that the Rams are, are a great pick. I, I think they're they're a dark horse hit candidate to win it all this year, though they are in an incredibly competitive division alongside my dark horse pick, the 49ers. Right, exactly. We were talking about one of the most difficult uh, divisions because you have a few nice up and coming teams when you talk about the Cardinals and then obviously the Seahawks mm-hmm. with Russell Wilson are going to be competitive every year. Uh, yep. Next on our really, really long shots, there are two teams I'm pegging. Um, because the Broncos at plus 6,600 could possibly land a disgruntled Aaron Rodgers. And if you slot Aaron Rodgers on any team, all of a sudden they become a Super Bowl contender. And so that would kind of be like my similar pick to what I did with the Bucks last year when I was hoping they make it Brady. I might throw five, ten dollars in the off chance that the Broncos go ahead and they get Aaron Rodgers. They've been searching for a quarterback Mm -hmm. since Peyton Manning. And when you talk about their offensive skill players with Noah Fant, Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler, this is a team that's decent. Can I, can I give an unusual pick? That's, mm-hmm. that's going to be a little controversial. Uh, the Indianapolis Colts. Okay. Um, that's a team that's got a very, very strong defense. They've got a very strong core on their offense. And by core, I mean great offensive line, serviceable kind of like weapons, not amazing, but serviceable. And then you're upgrading from Philip Rivers. Well, can you call it an upgrade? But you're going to Philip Rivers to Carson Wentz, where potential it's a upgrade. totally, you know, potential. And he's, and he's reunited with Frank Reich, right? So that's something mm-hmm. that could be pretty, pretty exciting. And hey, you know, the Colts made it into the playoffs and almost beat the Bills in the first game. And the Bills are they're not, they're not even a dark horse pick. The Bills are 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 one of the favorites this year. Yeah, to be a they're contender. a top five favorite. So, so like if you look at the AFC South, Texans. They're, they're, what the hell's going on there, right? You got the Titans who are constantly in it. You got the Jags who are still in rebuild mode. The Colts could easily win that division. And next thing you know, you know, Carson Wentz in the playoffs, well, he doesn't really have too good of a track record. He's going to get injured. Nick Foles comes in, big dick Nick. They won the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> you know, <laughs> That's what you need. You just need Nick Foles to come back and, and everything will be right yeah. in the world. That's it. If, I, if I'm an NFL team and my team goes into the playoffs, I'm sneaking in somebody in the night. I'm tearing my quarterback's ACL. I'm signing Nick Foles. And I'm winning the Super Bowl, baby. <laughs> and David, that's exactly why you don't run an NFL organization. <laughs> I don't get it. I, you know, I, 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 I submit my resume every day. <laughs> they always shoot you down when you get to the phone call and you explain that, that that's your plan. There's uh, 31 days in a, in a month. Every single day I apply to a new NFL team. I just rotate through and it's just like, stop applying. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe they just don't understand that this is the recipe for success. So you aren't missing out on them. They're missing out on you in the end. That's, 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 I thank you, Connor. That's the support I needed this morning. <laughs> so two other teams I wanted to shout out as a uh, long shot odds. 
I'm going to go with the Chargers at plus 3,000. So 30 to 1 odds. I like the Chargers a lot. Last year, they were both top 10 in offense and defense, which is surprising because their record was pretty bad. But I have to uh, put a lot of that on the coaching staff and Anthony Lynn, who they are replacing this year. Justin Herbert's going to be uh, in his second season with still very good weapons around him. Keenan Allen's obviously a stud. And so Herbert, who won Rookie of the Year, his second year is probably going to be even better. Let's be honest. Why wouldn't it be? Um, and, Chargers, I think, and, and, are definitely a great long shot. Some, so it's a team that, they just that breaks my up. algorithms, too, because I, I, I build these automatically updating power rankings, and I had the Chargers in the top 10 based on their stats last year. And I was like, this, this can't be right. But if, if my, the data is true, I like them as a long shot. And to go back to our conversation to start this discussion, you know, Bengals, Giants, Dolphins making draft picks to get more weapons. Chargers are a team that actually went and drafted the offensive line mm-hmm. to help protect Herbert, right? Like they took Rashawn Slater, the second, second tackle off the board. Like you gotta, you gotta look at that and feel pretty good about that draft pick. It, it fits my style of drafting, to be honest. So that's why I, I don't mind taking a team that's going to be conservative and protect their investment in their quarterback. So I like that a lot. Mm-hmm. Were there any other teams you liked as a long shot, David? Um, I mean, honestly, I, I, I'm a big believer in Bill Belichick. I don't think the Patriots are winning the Super Bowl this year. Um, that being said, I do think that the Patriots return to the playoffs. I think Cam Newton in the second year, I don't think Mac Jones is going to start. I think Cam Newton in the second year in the system, things are going to start clicking a little bit more. We're going to get a lot of opt outs that are coming back in this year. So I do think that the Patriots will make the playoffs, especially in a seven game playoff format, uh, seven team playoff right. format. Sorry. So I don't think they're winning the Super Bowl, but I wouldn't be surprised to see the Patriots make it into the you know divisional round, if not the AFC championship this year. That being said, I would also, sorry, let me put it this way. Would I not be surprised? No, I wouldn't be too surprised, but I would be very happy <laughs> if that happened. <laughs> So maybe we don't go with the Super Bowl bet on the Pats, but maybe we we go ahead and bet on their record and we say that we think they're going to be above 500 this year, which which they won't. I, 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 I like that. I like that. Great. Mm-hmm. That's what we want to do. We want to give our listeners actionable insights. And so, David, that's exactly what you're doing. And we love it. One, one, more, one more thing on the Chargers. They drafted one of my favorite players in the draft, Asante Samuel Jr. in the second round. And Asante Samuel was an NFL stud back in the you know mid 2000s he was a he was our best cornerback on the 2007 patriots team dropped a pick from um from your team connor dropped a pick on eli manning that jesus can't speak he dropped a potential game ceiling interception that eli manning threw and then he after that a couple passes later ended up throwing the touchdown to plaxico burris and then asante samuel went on to have a pretty successful career on the eagles too so it's pretty cool to see him watch his son get drafted by the Chargers. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like that pick a lot too. Somebody I thought was going to go around 10 picks earlier, maybe to the Jets even when they took Elijah Moore. Yep. Um, yep. So David, you know, you're having some technical difficulties on Zoom. You're having some verbal difficulties at this point. I think it's time that we get you off the show. We let you recuperate ah, a little yeah. bit. Um, but hey, is there anything you wanted to plug, you know, wh- what do you have going on in the works? What should be people be checking out? Yeah, hundred percent. Appreciate that, Connor. I mean, for, for those that are listening, I want to talk about a project that I've been working on with a couple of really close friends of mine. Um, so we're, we're avid poker fans. We've been playing poker together, kind of like in, you know, poker night settings in person or poker online with each other for years now. And when the pandemic started up, we couldn't really find a website that was perfect and fit all of our needs to just do a poker night with friends. We're not trying to play with strangers online. We wanna get our six friends together into a poker room and play poker in a perfect place for that. So we ended up creating a website called Home Game Poker, where it's fully set up in a way that you can play poker the way that you do it in your home. And so it's the ideal solution during the pandemic. We've been working on it. A lot of cool new rollouts coming out. Um, you guys should check it out, homegamepoker.com, and hop on. You know, hope you guys enjoy it. It's a it's, it's a fun work in progress. Yeah, I would absolutely recommend Home Game Poker. It's a website that I've been on. I have an account. I've played a couple of games, and it's been a lot of fun. 
something that if, if you're trying to schedule a, a game of poker with friends, it's not easy to do on these main gambling sites because they're in it to make money. David, you're in it to create an awesome time for people on your website. And that's, that's exactly what we're here for with all things analysis too. So yeah, definitely go ahead, check out home game poker, check out all things mm-hmm. analysis, all things analysis.com guys. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter at all that analysis. Uh, they have a character limit. Uh, and I want to plug, we're doing a giveaway right now for people who sign up. So you'll be entered to win. Oh, you can't see it unless I put it in front of me because of my Zoom background. This is the Panini Donruss Blaster Box. So if you go ahead and you follow us, subscribe to us and create an account on our website or any of the combination, you'll get an entry into our giveaway, which is coming on May 8th. So David, I don't know if you're in on the giveaway yet, if you created an account, but now's your shot. Uh, and uh, then- I'm a, I'm a, It's a no brainer. It's a no brainer. <laughs> I love it. And since this is Vicious Talk with Benny P, I'm going to send us off with his classic, uh, Are You Vicious? All right, guys. Thank you. To my